So this evening, very pleased to welcome you, Keith, Professor Keith Fox, who's going to be speaking to us about bioethics, our biologists opening Pandora's box. Uh, let me just do a, a brief introduction of Keith for those who, uh, who don't know him. Keith Fox is Emeritus Professor of Biochemistry at Southampton University. He served for six years as Associate Director and then Director of the Faraday Institute until September 2021. Keith's research interests concern DNA structure and its recognition, and his scientific work's been published in over 200 papers and articles. He was senior executive editor of Nucleic Acids Research from 2008 to 2021. He's a former chair and trustee of Christians in Science and is the editor of Science and Christian Belief. Keith is also a licensed lay minister in the Church of England and has special interests in Christian apologetics, creation evolution, and bioethics and genome modification. His book with Alexander Massman, Modifying Our Genes, Theology, Science, and Playing God, was published by SCM Press in March 2021. So Keith, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Looking forward to your lecture. Over to you. Well, thank you for your kind welcome, and thank you, too, for daring to uh, indulge a mere biochemist to pontificate about things ethical. I'm sure there are others who are far better qualified than me as ethicist. But we do want to ask the question this evening, and I'm going to pose questions to you rather than necessarily uh, give answers. So according to the title, in Greek mythology, Pandora... Pandora's box was a gift from the gods to Pandora, the first woman on earth. It contained the evils of the world which were released when she opened the box. Too late, she hastily closed the lid, but only one thing was left inside at that stage, and that was hope. In the Christian tradition, the metaphor would be one of taking the forbidden fruit, leading to a fallen world which needs redemption. And in this lecture, I want to ask whether we are doing something similar with recent scientific discoveries, asking questions, uh, maybe even, maybe we're getting, we're, uh, we're getting answers and asking questions that we will later regret. The Christian scriptures indeed might appear to suggest that some things are indeed best left unknown. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, says the Deuteronomist. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow, the more knowledge, the more grief. Or don't try to understand things that are too hard for you or investigate matters that are beyond your power to know. Well, this evening I'm deliberately going to look at some science fiction scenarios. Uh, as today's science fiction quickly becomes tomorrow's science fact, and we need to be ready beforehand, not playing ethical catch-up after everything has already happened. The word bioethics was actually coined less than a century ago, and during the last part of the 20th century, largely focused on biomedical ethics, which often concerned things about the beginning and the end of life, with forays into genetic modification of plants and animals. But fascinating and exciting advances in the biological sciences in the last 20 or so years have opened up many new biological questions some of which are summarized in this slide that I took from the Nuffield Council of Bioethics. And I know you won't be able to read that, but it emphasizes just how many things there are that are on the horizon. The issues that are raised pose fundamental questions of what it means to be human, how we value other people, and the world of nature in which we live. In most cases this evening, I'm going to spare you the details of the science, though I personally find that fascinating. But I want to ask questions about what we should do with the knowledge that we've gained. I want to also, at the outset, to make it quite clear that I am definitely not anti-science. After all, I worked in fundamental science research for over 40 years. Neither will I be questioning the scientific discoveries. Unfortunately, Christians are sometimes perceived as being opposed to science or fearful of it, rather than seeing it as God's good gift to humankind. The question is not the science itself, but what we do with the knowledge 
or even to consider whether we should be asking some questions. Of course, if some people don't see a problem and suggest we should just let take things take their course. Uh, here is the well-known public intellectual Steven Pinker, who a few years ago wrote the, that bioethicists, the best thing they can do is to get out of the way, to let things take their course. I hope you'll agree with me that that seems to be a rather lazy and possibly very risky attitude to take uh, to new scientific discoveries. So in this lecture, I want to consider four topics that are all related to this wonderful molecule that I was privileged to study for many years, DNA, and the ways in which we can now manipulate it, read it, and store it. As I have studied the molecule itself for a long time, we've known the sequence of the human genome for over 20 years. That's the order of those three billion letters that make up each one of our cells and differs between you and the person next to you by roughly one in every thousand of those letters. James Watson, one of the discoverers of the double helical structure, is reported to have said, we used to think that our future was in the stars. Now, in large part, we know, uh, now consider that it is in our genes. So the four areas that I want to consider, and don't worry, I'm not going to give equal length to each one of them, so don't get fidgety if we've only got halfway through the subjects and we're most of the way through the time. Firstly, I want to consider human genome editing, not just for curing diseases, but for how we might use it for optimizing our abilities. To consider something called polygenic risk factors, that's how knowledge about combinations of genes can affect our complex characteristics and how we might use those or misuse them uh, to predict our own characteristics. I want to say something a little bit uh, more amusing about DN direct to consumer DNA testing and something that you may not have thought about ethically, de-extinction. And if any of those terms seem unfamiliar with you, I hope I'll be able to lead you through them as we go through this talk. So first, human genome editing. What's been known as CRISPR. Let's be honest here, life just isn't fair, is it? From diseases to abilities, whether we're talking about musical ability, athletics, intelligence, life can seem like a genetic lottery. At one end of the spectrum, some people are naturally gifted, while others suffer from life-changing and life-threatening tragic diseases as a result of genes. Wouldn't it be good if we could level the playing field? There are, I'm told, between four and 6,000 gen diagnosed genetic conditions. And estimates are that between one, uh, about one in every 25 children is affected by some form of genetic disorder. Some are tragically apparent at birth, while others are only diagnosed at later stages in life. And this slide uh, gives a few examples of uh, some of the best known ones of them. And in some examples, some instances, a, only a single letter change in three billion letters in the human code can lead to terrible diseases. A, a well-known example of such a condition is a sickle cell disease, which is caused by one letter change in the gene for hemoglobin. There is no cure for this, though genetic testing of newborns can allow early treatment, while a testing to identify carriers can inform couples of the risks of having children. Wouldn't it be good, though, if we could change the genetic code to edit it back to the fully functional form? What if we could cut out and replace the faulty gene using molecular scissors with the genetic equivalent of cut and paste that we're now so familiar with with word processors? Well, in the last 10 to 15 years, such technologies have become available. Talons, ZFNs, and I suppose we should call them ZFNs, and most powerfully, CRISPR-Cas9. These can be easily adapted, particularly the latter one, to any DNA sequence, and they're widely used in laboratories across the world in fundamental biochemical and biological research. It is hard to exaggerate their importance. In fact, John Parrington, in his book, wrote, the words revolutionary and breakthrough can be overused in media reports about new scientific discoveries. But every once in a while, a discovery is made whose impact on society is likely to be so immense that even an abundance of superlatives may not do it full justice. 
and genome editing looks likely to be such a discovery. Well, using it as a laboratory tool is one thing, but what about applying it to people? Applying it to treat somatic or developed cells, that's in real people, is largely impractical because our bodies contain trillions of cells, each one of which contains the same genetic code. And modifying all trillion of those would be an impossibility, though there have been a few instances in which it's been successfully implied for modifying just a small number, and that is sufficient to give, restore some of the function. That's especially so for blood disorders. It is extremely expensive and unlikely to be widely employed for treating whole people. The major ethical within, issue with this is one of risk. What if other sequences are accidentally modified? After all, it's not like a simple drug treatment in which if there's side effects, you simply stop taking the drug and hope that the side effects go away. Your genome would have been irreversibly changed. However, for treating adults, there is at least patient content, consent and proper autonomy. However, it would be more efficient, wouldn't it, to modify germ cells or early embryos, single cells, before implanting them by IVF, thereby completely eliminating the genetic condition in every cell of that, the child that we're born forever. And not just that child, but for all future generations, whether the modification has been good or bad. Of course, some people, and it's not me, will inevitably object to any work on embryos. And therefore, if that's you, you will uh, have objections to almost everything that I will say in the rest of this talk. The ethical problems associated with this te technique, though, were apparent at an early stage. And scientists across the globe agreed that there should be a moratorium on applying it to embryos, that could, because it could, especially those that could lead to conception. And here's the statement from the NIH, National Institute of Health. There are strong arguments against engaging in the technology that will lead to conception. As you, and however, as you may be familiar, in November 2018, the Chinese scientist Hui Zhuanghui announced to the world that he'd done just that. And he successfully edited the CCR5 gene in human embryos, producing some resistance to HIV infection, leading to the birth of twin girls. Pandora's box had been opened, though to my knowledge, the results of that have never been published in the scientific literature, although he spent three years, I think, in jail. There was a general outcry and condemnation from the scientific community, not least because it broke many of the ethical rules. It was unnecessary, it was of no therapeutic benefit, and there was, in that case, very limited parental consent. Is the whole thing necessary? Well, actually, for conditions that are caused by single gene defect, defects, where one or both parents are known to be carriers, then pre-implantation genetic testing can be used on early embryos before IVF to select the ones that are not effective. So in most single gene conditions, there is no need to do any editing, just selecting. Much of the criticism of the technique concerned risk what if off-target mutations were introduced at the same time? And the literature gives a wide range of answers as to whether it is prone to modifying the wrong genes as well as the right ones. We do, after, after all, know that genes work in networks, very often more than having more than one function. And if we imagine that as a spider's web, tugging at one corner of the web could have effects on unrelated pathways. Indeed, there's very, some very limited evidence that the gene that was altered to give resistance to HIV uh, might give increased susceptibility to some other viral infections. I have to be honest that some of the motives behind the scientists' criticisms were sometimes a little self-serving, because they would say, if it all goes wrong, then there'll be a public backlash, and future science, will be, uh, science funding will be in jeopardy, and then that's going to put my research programs in, 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 in a problem. But is risk the only issue? Well, we have to admit that life is risky anyway, and conception by the more enjoyable traditional method is also not without risk. But others see that there is a problem. Is it's the start of the slippery slope? 
Could we be modifying genes for non-therapeutic reasons, leading to enhancements, transhumanism, and the commodification of human life? And we will come back to that later. So, all other things considered, should it be permitted? We're now well used, aren't we, to organ transplants. Is this just a DNA transplant? Well, I would argue no, as it has the potential to affect the nature of the individual, as well as all subsequent generations from that individual. However, for some life-threatening, tragic diseases, I do think it seems appropriate, and it is worth the risk. After all, for Christians, treating disease and looking after the vulnerable and disadvantaged have always been significant commitments for Christians. For those conditions, this may be part of the God-given arsenal of techniques for alleviating human suffering, and a knee-jerk approach may be inappropriate. After all, when Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees for breaking their Sabbath rules, he simply asked whether it was lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill. So what is a disease and what is normal? Where would we stop? There's a sliding scale of severity and likelihood. From the debilitating diseases for which the newborn will only survive maybe a few days, to cystic fibrosis that gives an altered lifestyle, to Huntington's disease that would develop much later in life, to some cancers that have increased risk to the cosmetic sorts of changing eye color or maybe intelligence. What is normal? Well, let's be honest, there's only one normal person in this room to my perspective, and that's me, and all you are rather strange. And I'm sure you have much the same attitude. Take, for example, deafness. For those born genetically deaf, and there is a, a point, single point mutation, in a gene that lives, links to genetic deafness. Should deaf parents be allowed to suggest, su select an embryo for implanting by IVF that will result in a deaf child? Is deafness normal? For the deaf community, it isn't a disability, it's a culture with its own language, sign language. The law in that instance said, no, it should not be allowed. I wonder what you would have said. What is a disease for some, after all, is a strength or a culture for others. Remember, the Apostle Paul had his thorn in the flesh through which he learned that God's power is made perfect in weakness. And we must not use that as an excuse to accept disease too lightly. We must not have a misplaced fatalism that sees everything as God's will. Tom Shakespeare, who is an academic and a spokesperson for the disabled, said, quite, I think, quite movingly, that people with disabilities are unlikely to be queuing up for genetic modification. Their priority is to combat discrimination and prejudice. Rather, we need to ensure that we provide robust support for those who are less able, rather than just try and change them. And an overblown enthusiasm for genome editing may avoid the question of how society includes people whose impairments may not be simply edited away. Are we in danger of saying to some people, do you know, I wish you'd never existed? As we begin to think about possible enhancements, are we in danger of sidelining people who don't fit into our preconceived ideas or our social norms about what is normal? If that sounds far-fetched, then think for a moment about cosmetic surgery and our perceptions of what is beautiful. Who says? Those are social and cultural constructs with considerable peer pressure to conform to what is perceived to be, at least within the Western society, perceived to be beautiful. And for those genes that lead to disability, will there be social pressure on patient parents to use gene editing to be sure that their child will not be an economic drain on society? And will there, therefore, as a result, be less research into treatment and less support for sufferers? Well, to return to what is normal, I hope we'd all agree that human diversity is part of what it takes to make society. We are gifted in all sorts of different ways. Do you know, I run to keep fit. I could never be a top athlete. I don't have the right genes. I don't have the right muscle format. But I don't think that labels me as being in any way disabled. 
I'm just not an athlete. We acknowledge the free and unmerited nature of life as a gift, and we work with what we have, so that excellence then consists in working with our natural talents and gifts, and which are actually of no doing of the athlete who possesses them. After all, you might agree with me that life is a gift, not an achievement. Many people worry that genome editing for therapeutic reasons will be the slippery slope to human genome enhancements. What if we could improve intelligence or athletic ability or musical ability just by tinkering with our children's genes before they're born? And we're not necessarily talking about inserting non-human genes, but ensuring that the child gets the best combination of the available human genes that are there already in the human population, shuffling the pack so that your child gets the best. There will, of course, be choices to make. For one genetic choice may exclude others. I don't think you could have a muscle type for sprinting that would be compatible with weightlifting. There is already considerable progress in understanding some of these complex genetic profiles, which I'll come back to later. But if this could be possible, then it would change our view of human life. If genomes are being modified to suit parents' preferences, then children start to become commodities rather than precious gifts. Most parent-child relationships are based on indeterminacy, in which the child is loved whatever. And that would change if children are made to order. In fact, some people have likened this to the difference between begetting and making. And those who say the creeds, the Christian creeds, would be familiar with the idea of begotten, not made. Begetting implies a personal, non-manipulative relationship with an element of mystery. In contrast, making reduces children to products of parents' clever creating, which can only compromise their relationship with a child. Though as any parent of teenage children will be aware, they do make their own choices. A child genetically enhanced for athletic ability can still choose to be a couch potato. But is this just a soft version of private eugenics, shaped by consumerism? Or is it more sinister than that? After all, parents wish the best for their children, don't they? And as the American bioethicist Professor Arthur Kaplan wrote, do you know renegade uh, scientists and totalitarian loonies are not the folks most likely to abuse genetic engineering? You and I are. Not because we're bad, but because we want to do good. Parents, understandably, want to give their kids every advantage. And the most likely way for eugenics to end our lives is through the front door, as nervous parents awash in advertising and marketing hype struggle to ensure that their little bundle of joy is not left behind. We might even imagine a form of what I might call genetic obsolescence, as the technology advances in the same way that computer programs regularly have updates, so a genetic enhancement to life 2.0 may seem totally inadequate as soon as life 3.0 becomes available. And today's enhanced child may seem as only yesterday's child. When should you have children? And it's not such a great leap, is it, from you can have a genetically improved baby to suggest that it would be irresponsible to have a disabled child. And so you must have a genetically improved baby. There is in this world a rather a lot of conflict. What about engineering people so that they're more virtuous? We know that neurotransmitters, things affect our emotions. Excesses of neuroadrenaline can make us more prone to anger and genetic variants of the so-called warrior gene may affect, although Be careful, not determine that. Different types of dopamine receptor affect risk-taking. Are we genetically programmed to be virtuous or not? Could we imagine a genetic virtue project? This paper published a few years ago suggested nearly all personality traits show moderate heritability. Since genes influence enduring behaviors, it might be possible to use technology in a manner that would promote virtue 
and thus serve as a means to improve ourselves, morally speaking? Or do you think we could be genetically programmed to be virtuous? Should we know about this? And if so, should we try to change it? I think probably it's best not to know. Contrast that with Thomas Jefferson, who wrote, Virtue is not hereditary. It has to be earned and it has to be learned. Neither is virtue a permanent quality in human nature. It has to be cultivated continually and exercised from hour to hour and from day to day. Or to paraphrase Aristotle and his views on habit-forming learned behaviors, fake it until you make it. There's also a great difference, isn't there, between virtuous temperament and taking good moral actions. So we have two contrasting views. One says it's the end of our species or the beginning of a new future. Is this te technology that affects our understanding of humanity and opens the door to a form of neo eugenics eugenda that could threaten, threaten the survival of the human species? Or does this, rec does this show a post-human species that will leave today's homo sapiens in the archives of evolutionary history? Enhancing for complex factors such as intelligence, they are affected by many, many genes, and that may seem impossible. But be warned, it is more likely than you may imagine. Which brings me to the subject of what I call polygenic risk analysis. Our complex characteristics are affected by many, maybe hundreds, of genes working in concert, each one of which has only a very small effect. But together they begin to describe who we are. Changing one of these will have an undetectable effect. So, for example, a good education is much better than changing a single intelligence gene, uh, with the obvious exception of those genes that lead to se serious mental impairment. This enormous amount of genetic data enables researchers to calculate which variants tend to be found more frequently in groups of people and who have a given trait or disease. And with large databases and computer modeling around it, it is possible to assemble a, a polygenic risk score for any trait or disease and so be able, at least in theory, to assess the probability, and use that word, that an individual will be affected. Note that these are predictions, and they're predictions that are, co that are correlations and do not imply causation. All of this is done without knowing the genes that are involved in any complex disease or the molecular mechanisms that are involved. And as a biochemist, I find that rather uh, unsatisfying. A polygenic risk score can ex only explain relative risk, not absolute one. Their probability is based on large cohorts, and they can say little about an individual for which each gene will appear in the context of many other unrelated genes and, importantly, environmental factors. Moreover, the databases from which these genome data are derived contains an overabundance of genes from what are called weird people. That's like people like you and me. And by weird, that means Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And they may well not be representative of the global population. The concept of uh, polygenic scores has been best expounded by Robert Plomin in his, uh, his book, Blueprint. He's an eminent psychologist and geneticist. And the take-home message from his book is simply that DNA isn't all that matters, but it matters more than everything else put together. And he has the shocking observation that nice parents have nice children because they are nice genetically. Remember again, it's based on probabilities, good for populations, but saying much less about the individual. Now, if that is correct, it means that during IVF, as well as selecting against any unwanted disease genes, you might pick the embryo that has the best combination for a particular trait, say, intelligence. This would be an advanced form of embryo selection. And this was highlighted in the Washington Post a couple of years ago, saying a new age of genetic screening is coming and we don't have any rules for it. Of course, this will be rather limited for routine IVF as there will only be a small number of embryos to choose from 
and the possible combinations will, of course, be limited by what was there in the parents' genes. But you might imagine a future scenario in which the embryo can be modified to give the best combination. This comes rather close to the 19th century ideas of eugenics. Why leave your children to chance? Engage in selection in the way that we do for your animals, your chickens, and your cattle, and your pigs. This brave new world of genetic prediction might ju not also just be used for embryos. It might also be used for life insurance companies before issuing you with a policy. By preschools and colleges scoring your DNA as part of their admissions process. Or by dating sites asking for your genetic uh, profile before offering you a match. In previous talks, when I've given, talked about this, I've put this slide up and I'm saying that belief in genetic determinism tends to lead to more conservative political ide ideologies. Because if human nature is largely determined by our genes, then social problems don't come from the structure of society, but in some of the individuals that make up the society. And the solution, therefore, is to change the individuals, or even eliminate them, as in the Nazi Third Reich. Eliminate those rather than change social structures. And to be honest, when I said that, I thought I was scaremongering. More akin to Nazi-style selection for the perfect Aryan race. However, for various reasons, I was recently prompted to do a Google search for polygenic scores and Dominic Cummings. <laughs> you might do that. And I discovered his blog, in which we read that almost everything written about MP, by MPs about social mobility is junk. And he cites Plomin's book, Blueprint. And he goes on to question investment in early years education promoting, promoting social mobility, because it's all determined by genes. Why bother with Sure Start and other social programs? Although I have to be quite clear that Cummings is not suggesting that we should scrap any idea of social mobility. But it comes very close to saying that we should concentrate on the genetic best and forget the rest. Seems like a short step from Huxley's Brave New World. Alpha children wear grey. They work much harder than we do because they're so frightfully clever. I'm really glad that I'm not. I'm a beta because I don't have to work so hard. And then we're much better than the gammas and the deltas, aren't we? Gammas are stupid. Or the film Gattaca, in which discrimination is now down to a science. Even if the science is correct, and even if it is possible to predict intelligence with any degree of accuracy, and I would question that, then I think it's a step too far, and I'd rather not know. As Lee Silver noted in his book a few years ago, the consequences could be that we have, we'll have a gene-rich society that becomes a separate species, and gene-rich will inevitably mean financially rich. We might also ask the question whether faster, brighter, or stronger means better, as Stephen Locke wrote in the BMJ a few years ago, many researchers think that a high IQ goes hand in hand with high moral values. And this, of course, is absolute nonsense. I wonder if we will have made better people or simply enhanced humans. Well, for the last part of this talk, let's lighten the load a little bit and talk about one or two other more fun things. I wonder how many people here have had their DNA tested with Ancestry.com or 23andMe? Surprisingly few, actually. Maybe that's because it's a Cambridge audience. I haven't, at least I haven't yet. They tell us that it is the gift that tells you who you really are. Unlocks the truth about your heritage and your future. Why would you want to do that? It can identify <coughs> disease risk, and so lead to changes in lifestyle. Over a 23andMe health survey in 2019 reported only 76% made any change of, their, uh, of, of, of what they do. In fact, a large proportion, it made no change at all. A large number of people do it out of a sense of curiosity or to discover something about their ancestry, and that actually concerns uh, something I'd be interested in as well. People do it for fun to trace their genealogy. But once your data are there, they can be discovered by relatives. In fact, you may not have taken a test, 
but a close relative of yours may have done, and some form of your genetic code exists already in the cloud for somebody else to discover. If you did it, what would you do with the result? What shocks are you prepared to discover? It could reveal skeletons in the family cupboard, things that are best forgotten. Who are our real parents? Are they those who rear us or those who sh with whom we share our genes? Once you know, you can't unknow. And in some tragic instances, it has led to the breakup of apparently stable relationship when sins of the past, long forgotten, have been uncovered. You may learn things about your health that you don't anticipate. And once again, once you know, again, you can't unknow. You may be able to take preventive action in some, but what if it reveals a predisposition to Alzheimer's for which there is no known cure? And that threat will then hang over you for the rest of life as you forget your keys and begin to think, is this the beginning of the slippery slope? Should you tell your parents? They will have passed the gene on to you. Or should you tell your children? Because they will have in may have inherited it. I feel that we'll be producing a generation of hypochondriacs or that it will have serious effects on people's anxiety and mental health. The fact also is that most people, including some men, most scientists, don't understand probability and risk. Let me give an example. I'm sorry it's somebody else from the Conservative Party. So it was in the press a few years ago. Matt Hancock, he was then Health Secretary and who we can assume is well-educated and intelligent. <laughs> Why'd you laugh? His tests showed that he had a 15% risk of developing prostate cancer and said that this knowledge saved his life. However, the average lifetime risk of somebody of his age is actually 18%, so he actually has a lower risk than average. There was a fascinating series on Radio 4 at the end of last year called The Gift. I, I recommend it. Looking at stories of people whose lives have been affected by learning things that they would really rather not have known. There is also a question too of who owns the genomic data. You can tick a box on a 23andMe or the Ancestry to say whether you wish it to be public or not or given to other companies. And in October 23, uh, 23andMe received $20 million um, from GSK to share that information. Some of that is very good. It's being used to fast-track new drug, drug discoveries, and that seems like a good thing. And at least one is already in phase one clinical trials working to block CD96, a protein that plays vital roles in modulating the body's immune responses. More worrying is that in, also in October 23, the 23andMe database was hacked and some things were offered for sale. And as proof of, of the breach, the hacker published the alleged data of one million users of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. And there's a risk of discrimination within that. They also published the list of various Chinese users. So it has its fun side, but it has its implications. Finally, I want to quickly just look at the topic of de-extinction because it's fun. Using knowledge about DNA to bring back extinct species, nothing as old as the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, but things like the woolly mammoth, the Tasmanian tiger, the passenger pigeon, and the Pyrenean ibex. Colossal Biosciences is a company headed by George Church, who is a very clever biologist. And his company has the strap line of restoring the past for a better future. It all sounds fascinating, doesn't it? I'll skip over the details of how it might d be done, but I want to ask why would we do this? Maybe we do it out of a sense of curiosity and fun. Maybe to salve our consciences when humans have played a role in the extinction of species, such as the passenger pigeon and the thylacine. Or maybe we do it just because we can. But what does that say about our attitude to nature and our care for what's around us? Do we just want to produce zoological freaks? And in most cases, we wouldn't actually restore the old species, but generate by gene modification a new species that bears some semblance to the extinct one. I think we probably wouldn't get a woolly mammoth, but a hairy elephant with extra fat tissue. 
in the case of elephants too, they have a lot of learned behaviors that's passed from mother to offspring. And where's that learned behavior going to come from for restored woolly mammoths? And who's going to teach them how to forage on the Arctic tundra? If it can restore the past, then why bother about the present? Should we bother with funding for conservation programs? If we mess it up, well, we can always restore it, can't we? Let's take it one stage further, just for fun. What about de-extincting the Neanderthals? It's real science fiction. We know the sequence of the Neanderthal genome is 99.7% similar to ours. That's still a lot of dissimilarity. If a human cell could be Neanderthalized, it could be implanted in the womb of a surrogate. Well, would it be a woman or a chimp? And then it might develop into a fetus. But we know from cloning experience that there is an extremely high failure rate. And we're going to get a lot of dead proto-Neanderthals. Would 100% recreated Neanderthal genome really be a Neanderthal? It'll have different environmental factors, different epigenetics, microbiomes, environments, and cultures. And a Neanderthal baby would need to grow and develop. It would be fascinating, wouldn't it? I'd love to know. We might even begin to discover if they have any sense of the divine. Are they too made in the image of God? I'd love to know. But I think, we, I hope you would agree with me. The answer should be no. So in the light of all things, as I come to a, to a conclusion, what might a Christian response to these things be? Given the scriptures say nothing about DNA or genes or embryos. Well, I want to quote for a moment uh, Tom Wright's writing on virtue, saying that rules alone will not be sufficient, for we're dealing with individual people with diverse personal backgrounds. Jesus didn't hold himself up as an example of someone who kept the rules, reinforcing and reinterpreting them. He wasn't reducing things just to rules, nor could it be arrived at by calculating and weighing the likely effects on behaviors. Nor was Jesus saying that people should do what comes naturally. Indeed, what comes naturally actually is the source of the problem. The only way that we can get to the heart of the moral challenge Jesus offered, he says, is by thinking in terms not of rules or of the calculation of effects of romantic ex existentialism, but of virtue. And for the Christian, that virtue is one that has been transformed by the kingdom of God and the cross. Let me suggest a few things for you that originate from the idea that humanity is created in the image of God and try and unpack what they mean. It cannot be defined by our genetics. We're 98% similar to chimpanzees, but they are not made 98% in the image of God. Neither is the human genome sacred, as some have suggested. After all, there is no such thing as the human genome. Yours is different to mine and different to anybody else's here in many positions. In addition, God is spirit, not flesh and blood like us. So any physiological comparisons are not helpful. However, God is relational. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we too, in whatever we do, must honor that relationality. All people are made in God's image, not just the special ones. The rich or the poor, the strong or the weak, the healthy or the disabled. It means that all people have worth and dignity, regardless of what they can or they cannot do, or their ability to contribute to society. Each one is, has worth, loved by a creator, even if not necessarily loved by other people. All people are precious. And though we may have some things in common with other creatures, we are special. And if that sounds like speciesism, well, I'm sorry, it is. Genetic variation is another example, isn't it, of our individual human uniqueness. And it is the whole person who responds. Although we are made in God's image, we must also be careful that we are not God. Our mandate is to look after the creation as God's representatives, as his co-creators. We are told to subdue the earth. There is work to do, to cure diseases, alleviate suffering, and the application of science is one way that we fulfill that God-given calling. Indeed, creativity 
is very part of the image of God. We are God's co-creators. So we should act as collaborators with God, but being careful not to misuse the power or desire to be God. We must look after the diseased, develop medicines and care for each other and for creation. So new technologies should not be dismissed too readily. However, the Christian doctrine of sin should make us cautious of the dangers of hubris and arrogance. As the late Paul Ramsey, a Christian ethicist, wrote, men ought not to... Why is my thing gone funny? Men ought not to play God before they learn to be men. And after they've learned to be men, they will not play God. Humans should only play God the way that God plays God. That is, to promote human flourishing, and we should make these advances available to the whole of humankind. So, what if... Sorry, I missed the quote off the slide. What if... Well, I'm pessimistic. Some of these things will happen, even if we have strict rules. There will be human hubris, scientists, egos, and money at stake. We may have restrictions, which may be internationally agreed, but genetic tourism could well become a possibility for those who have the money. How will we respond? How will we treat those who've been modified? Are we going to treat them as freaks, or will they too be made in the image of God, just like you and me? What, we, what do we value in other people and in ourselves and in the natural world around us? I'll close with a quotation from C.S. Lewis well before the days of genetic modification in which he said, man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. And maybe we're in danger of following down that line. I'll finish there, but finally let me shamelessly suggest some reading material for you, taken both from the Christians in Science website, those things are freely downloadable, and from the Faraday Institute, uh, for, um, from the, the Faraday Papers, and particularly um, publicised the book that I co-authored with Alexander Massman, and anything I, that I've said he disagrees with is my fault, and anything that he agrees with, uh, he can take the full credit. Um, and I thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, I think <clears throat> you have really uh, given us quite a taste there of uh, the complexity of the, uh, the issues, the really important issues, bioethical issues that we need to be thinking about if we are not going to take the, uh, the Steven Pinker approach of, uh, of just getting out of the way. Um, you know, this is, this is, these, these are not issues that we, we can just hit, stick our heads in the sand on. Um, we have a little bit of time now for questions. Um, so I'm going to open it straight up to the floor. Um, if you do have a question, we've got a roving mic, uh, which someone will bring around to you. So um, please, do we have any, any questions that you'd like to ask? Uh, back to Keith. Yeah, at the back. Absolutely. I don't think there is one answer to the whole thing. You're, you're quite right to raise uh, twin studies. Uh, even genetically identical twins have different epigenetics and different environments in which they are, uh, they are reared, even though they may seem to be 
uh, the, the, the same. The technique is very powerful for understanding mechanisms in the laboratory, uh, for using with, with cell lines. But I do think we need to be careful, and maybe the lawyers can help us to decide where do we stop in terms of people. As I said, I think things that are tragically debilitating, risks are worth taking, if we know the source of that. But if it's something that's, if you like, life-changing a little bit, but not life-threatening, I think it's the beginning of a slippery slope. Um, because of the risks involved, because of the nature of which you change one gene, and it may well have interactions with all sorts of other ones that have other consequences. Um, would we modify an embryo if it had the gene for Huntington's disease? Now, that's not a probability. If you've got that gene, you will get Huntington's disease. Uh, later in life, in your 40s and 50s, uh, maybe, and have a perfectly n normal life up to that age. I, I think it's an open question as to whether we should do that or not. And sometimes, especially when the media become involved in it, it becomes a bit of a media circus, and each one of these actually is a tragic thing for the individual couple with their child. And those that go to the high court, high court my heart goes out to them, um, because it, it's not a media circus. This is dealing with people, real people, with real problems. I don't know if that answer, begins to answer your question, but it is very complicated. Thank you. Mm. And it does, I think, it raises the really important question as well of who in society, I mean, given the complexity, who in society ultimately is accountable for making the decisions that need to be made? Um, you know, is it lawyers? Is it government only? Is it biologists? Is it, you know, is it medics? You know, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's really important, and I think I'd take one, one class that you didn't include, and that is the general public. Mm -hmm. um, it's no good that the medics or the lawyers or whatever getting together and say these are the rules if the general public themselves have not seen the advantages or the disadvantages and they have a right to say yes or no along with the politicians who make the rules. That's why I'm hesitant about rules as to whether they actually be in any use or not because people will find ways around them and they'll go to another country. Right. Another question. Yeah, um, Dennis, in the back. Thank you, Keith. I, in terms of uh, lethal, you know, point mutations that where the child, if born, will die within the first five or eight years, something like that, and that's pretty certain. I mean, as you well know, there are many, many of those. Mm. Um, and my understanding is that you would be open to genome modification for that purpose. Do you think that the safety concern is really the only concern there, or would you want to add other ethical concerns to that decision? I think the safety concern is probably less relevant for those the diseases for which we can afford to take risk. Um, if the child is going to die in infancy, then taking a risk, risk may be less, uh, of, uh, less important. But I think there are other in issues as well. I mean, the whole de question of autonomy comes into this. I mean, I can imagine supposing my children have been modified and that they get to the teenage years and discover that. You can imagine their response. You did what to me and you never asked me? So I think that, that comes into it as well. The possibility of um, changing other genes, uh, the knock-on effect of changing one gene successfully, genes work in networks together. And it, I would be personally comfortable if it's a life-threatening disease for a child like that. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions on the other side of the room over here. Um, a bit further. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Um, can I get you to say something about our epigenome? Uh, it's a word that you didn't use, but, but clearly it determines uh, really how our genes are expressed. 
and we are changing that in modern medicine every day of the yep. week. Every drug that we take, uh, whether it's an antibiotic or a chemotherapy agent or, or metformin for our diabetes, changes our epigenome. So we're way into, way into the therapeutics of DNA, and I'd just be interested in, in your view yes. on that. Yes, I mean, it, it's not something which I uh, claim any expertise, but our epigenome is being modified all the time. Um, so in these studies with polygenic uh, scores, often that's only accounting for 50% of the variability at most. And the, us, uh, the rest is due to environmental factors, whatever those are, um, and which will modify our genomes by adding tags onto them that affect the way in which genes are, are, are expressed. And the, a whole range of factors affect that. Uh, now, the things that we eat, the stresses that we're under, uh, not just the medicines that we take. Um, so there are all sorts of other effects that add together with the genetic things. That's not to say that genetics isn't important, but often it's not deterministic because of all those other epigenetic effects that are going on at the same time. And I think that's, that's really uh, important across all the subjects that I, that I touched on today. Uh, 23andMe, don't check, test your epigenetic profile. Um, and when you're reintroducing any extinct species, who knows what their epigenetics were like? Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, well, I, I do apologize, because I think we could go on with questions for quite a while. Uh, we are going to have to call this part of the evening to a halt now, but there will be an opportunity in a minute um, to talk further uh, with Keith and to discuss this when we go over, uh, for drinks in the old library. Um, but. Um, yeah, I mean, Keith, you started uh, your talk uh, talking about Pandora's back box and how the only thing left in Pandora's box was hope, um, which kind of resonated with me thinking about the, um, uh, what is left, the Christian hope of God's plan for the universe and, uh, and redemption and restoration, but also hope in the sense of how we navigate through with wisdom through the challenges of everything that you've been describing over the next few years. I think we're going to need a lot of, a lot of wisdom. Um, 